Welcome to a Neon Jazz interview with radio host, jazz historian, teacher, and author, the great Chuck Haddock. He spoke with Neon Jazz about a wide range of topics. Namely, he spoke about his new book called Bird, The Life and Music of Charlie Parker. Over the course of our interview, we got to know about one of the most knowledgeable jazz minds in Kansas City, along with getting insights into the most famous KC jazz musician and arguably one of the most influential, not only in jazz, but in all of music, Charlie Yardberg Parker. Dig it. The first thing I want to do is I want to get kind of to weave a good audio tapestry here. I want to start with you and ask, where were you born and raised? I was born in Kansas City. Uh, I was born up north and raised in north. I moved south when I was about 21 years old. Uh, I went to Oak Park High School and then went to uh, the Metropolitan Community College System. Uh, went to Maplewood, went to Penn Valley, and went to MKC. So, are you a musician? No, I used to play trumpet when I was a kid, though. And um, I play music by ear. I play the turntable. I got gotcha. you. That's cool, man. You know, the one thing I did want to ask you, too, is when you look back on your life, did you dream of getting to a point where you would be a broadcaster, an author, and ultimately someone that was a real authority on, on music? You know, I, I, when I was younger, I wanted to be a writer, uh, but I wanted to be a poet or a novelist. And it just evolved into uh, the various uh, things that I do. Uh, you know, I first became introduced to jazz, really, when I started listening, well, when I listened to KPRS uh, during the 1960s, uh, on the, was in the right end of your of the AM dial, they would play things like Eddie Harris, Listen Here. And I was always into James Brown, and, you know, of course, Beatles and stuff like that, but, uh, and then, uh, also, I, I got a hold of Dave Brubeck's Take Five, and Stan Getz's uh, Girl from the Benigma albums. But really, when I became really interested in jazz, I started hanging out at, at Milton's Tap Room on Main Street, Maine, and Linwood. And, of course, Milton, you know, had a great record collection and, you know, played nothing but the coolest sounds. Mm -hmm. And so I started hanging out down at Milton's and listening to, uh, to records down there with him and became friends with him. And all the musicians used to hang out there, all the jazz musicians would hang out there. And uh, so then I became introduced to the Mutual Musicians Foundation. And, you know, after Milton's, we'd all go down to the foundation and jam all night long. And I started meeting all of these, um, all these people like Buddy Anderson, uh, you know, uh, Jay McShann, uh, you know, Ernie Williams, the last of the Blue Devils, George Salisbury, and all these jazz legends. I started hanging out with them. Yeah. And they told me stories about the old days in Kansas City, as did Milton. And that really sparked my curiosity. And I was working in the restaurant business at the time. I was working for Victoria Station. And I wanted to make a parallel career move. Uh, and there were a lot of people that hung out at Victoria that worked in the record business. They worked for either One Stops, which is a, a, a wholesaler where a small store can make one stop and pick up everything they want or a small label distributor house distributors and so uh, I made a parallel career, career move and moved into uh, working for a, a company called Friends 2 and this was a, uh, a wholesale distributor of uh, major label recordings and small label recordings and so I started collecting jazz I became an active promo sexual collecting promos <laughs> And it was located in the, in the, uh, uh, in the caves down on 31st Street. Mm -hmm. And down the... Hold on a second. Oh, you're, you bet. Sorry about that. Oh, that's cool. It, it, the cat just won't leave me alone. <laughs> like uh, well, let me, let me start again. Um, I was working at in, in Victoria Station, and uh, it was in the River Market, and all these, these people that worked in the record industry used to hang out down there. I was a bartender, and they'd hang out at the bar, and I started talking to them. And I really, I always liked the radio. I was always been crazy about the radio and listened to the radio all the time. And I liked records. I was a record collector. And so I managed to work my way into the record business, and I started working for a company called Two Friends, and it was in the caves down on 31st Street. And it was a uh, 
wholesale record distributor that was used by a lot of uh, small record stores. But, you know, we, we did the jazz records in, too. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and I, I uh, always shopped at Penny Lane down on Truist, which was a jazz store. I started shopping down there. And House Distributors, which was the uh, part of Penny Lane at that time, it was a wholesale, well, it was, it was, a, it was a small label distributor. They distributed things like Inner City, uh, you know, Flying Fish, Rounder. Mm-hmm. I started working for them. And eventually I took over the management of Penny Lane down in Warnell. Penny Lane was a jazz store. Yeah. I mean, you know, we sold nothing but jazz and blues and old-timey music. We didn't sell any rock and roll. We didn't sell any soul or anything like that, which was probably a big mistake because you're going to turn your back on a major market. Yeah. And so, uh, well, I was work. I started working there when we were out on Warnell, and then Hal decided, Hal Brody, who owned it, uh, uh, the lease was up, and he decided to move it and expand it because he wanted to make some money. And also, he wanted to put together house distributors with Penny Lane, so he bought the building on Broadway, and uh, uh, right there on the corner on Broadway, and I think it's like Broadway and 42nd Street, something like that, but it was, it was, a, it was a, a, you know, the, the Penny Lane was upstairs and the house was downstairs, mm-hmm. and so we started expanding the number of, of labels that we distributed to include Fantasy, Prestige, Milestone, Concord, and these other jazz labels. And at that time also, about 1980, uh, when we moved over there, we wanted to promote the store. So Don Mayberger and Leroy Johnson and, and a bunch of us got together. And we started the pitch, which was then known as the Penny Pitch. Huh. And so I became a jazz columnist. And I had a director of jazz column and I'd review jazz records. And, you know, I, I was just kind of making it up as I went along. Yeah. And then when we got, we, it really became a serious uh, monthly, it was a monthly event, uh, when we did an interview with Milton, when I did an interview with Milton Morris. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it opened all kinds of doors for me. Um, uh, Gaylord Marr, who's uh, the curator of emeritus of the Marr Sound Archives, where I work now, saw that and wanted to meet me. And, and Professor Bill Tuttle out of KU wrote, you know, a really nice note to the pitch about, you know, how much he enjoyed this. And I didn't realize what I was doing. I was just doing it. Yeah. That I was, that I was creating oral histories. And I worked in the record business for a while, and then, then I really wanted to make a, 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 a parallel career move. I wanted I got to where I wanted to be a jazz disc jockey. Mm-hmm. And so in 1984... Um, I applied for a job at, at KCUR because yeah. I wouldn't make any money in the record business. You don't make any money in the record business. You get a lot of records. Sure. You have a whole lot of fun, but you don't make any money. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, by 1984, I applied for a job at KCUR as an announcer, and I didn't get it then because they wanted a classical announcer. And later on, a month or so later, I got a call from uh, Ron Jones at KCUR. And he asked me if I would, you know, be interested in doing some jazz programming for them. And, you know, I had, over the years I'd accumulated a pretty significant jazz record collection. And um, and I knew a little bit about, I thought I knew more than I really did at that time, which is often the case when you're younger. Mm-hmm. And so I started doing jazz um, in October 84. And, uh, you know, I've been with Casey Ware ever since then. And so, I, and then when in 86, you know, my wife and I had, had, had Will, our first child, I really needed some security. So in 86, um, I went to work for, I was hired in December 86. I started working January 87. I started working for the Mars Sound Archives. Yeah. And as part of that, what, my, one of my responsibilities was to bring jazz collections into the, into the library, the Miller Nichols Library. Yeah. And so, you know, I started collecting records for the for them, and also I started collecting manuscript collections. And one of the first ones we got was that we received was uh, Dave Dexter Jr.'s collection. Mm-hmm. And Dexter had been a he was my inspiration. 
he met him right. And Milton loved Dexter. He respected respected Dexter. Everybody respected Dexter in Kansas City. And Dexter has been, of course, a writer since the 1930s. And uh, Dexter, I talked to Dexter all the time on the phone. He encouraged me to 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 write. And so I started writing for the Jam magazine and doing occasional pieces for other local publications. And so that's kind of like how I got into writing. I, I was an English major, so I always wrote creatively. But, uh, you know, like most, like a lot of poets, I wanted to write poetry so bad, and I did. Uh, you know, so I, I, I was naturally a writer. And uh, so that's when I started really kind of kicking up with the historic articles about Kansas City Jazz, and it was a process of discovery. As I received these collections and started reading about Kansas City Jazz, you know, I kind of became the local authority on Kansas City Jazz. Yeah. And the, really, the, 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 the big dog on the block was always Dick Wright out of KU. Mm -hmm. And Dick knew jazz, you know, don't get me wrong, but he, he was no authority on Kansas City Jazz, and I, so I immersed myself in Kansas City Jazz. Yeah. And then, about 1997, I got a call from Frank Driggs. Mm -hmm. And Frank Driggs had had a contract to write a history of Kansas City Jazz from, uh, from for Oxford University Press in the 70s and really had sketched in a couple of chapters that really hadn't written anything. He's a collector, uh, really, is what he, his main strength is he's a collector, he wasn't a writer. And so, we got together in New York and talked about, this is his home, and he had an unbelievable collection of, of photographs, mm -hmm. posters. Uh, I mean, a whole basement full. It was just very impressive. I went there to hustle his collection, really. <laughs> but we ended up agreeing to do the Kansas City book together, so uh, they, they reissued the contract and added me to it, and I started, you know, uh, researching and writing in earnest. That's that's a whole other level when you're talking about writing a book. Yeah. And Frank knew um, that the story was really in the Kansas City Call. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a year going through the Kansas City Call and indexing it from 1919 to 1943. And along the way, I uh, indexed the Kansas City Sun, which is an earlier African-American newspaper. And also I found a lot of information in the Journal Post including Dave Dexter's columns from the 30s, where he covered the scene both sides of town, the African-American side and the white side. Yeah. And then, so I did that, and then I created a timeline based on that that's 148 pages long, single space. I'm kind of obsessive compulsive. <laughs> and this one, then I started gathering together all the interviews. Yeah. That, and Frank would send me transcriptions of his interviews that he'd done. I started gathering together all of the interviews, and then, when I wrote the Kansas City book, I wrote it to be episodic, uh, wrote it like a screenplay. Mm -hmm. So that when Benny Moten would leave town, when Andy Kirk would come back to town, the focus would shift to Andy Kirk. And I would take these like 10 years period of time and see what happened, and then what actually happened in the call, and then I would check the interviews and I, and I wove the two together to create the narrative. Yeah. And so that's how I really became a, a serious writer. And I've written a lot of things like, you know, Julia, uh, like I worked on the box set, Julia Lee Can't See Star. Uh, and I've done a lot of projects. I've done a lot of consulting work. But that's where I really got serious. And then when I did the Kansas City book, there was uh, there were two chapters on Charlie Parker, uh, two extra chapters, nine excuse me, 10 and 11, I think, covered Charlie Parker's career. And I just kept writing, you know, after I finished the story of Kansas Jazz, and I thought, you know, there's a there's really a, uh, another biography here. So I held back those two chapters. And then after um, the publication of Kansas City Jazz, Rag Time to Bebop, I continued my research into Charlie Parker and continued and decided to do a biography of him. And what spurred me on is that I realized, in, based upon my research, that, you know, none of the biographies had really touched on much on his life in Kansas City. Yeah. And, you know, he lived here for his first 21 years of his life, and he lived to be 34. Yeah. And so there's this 
big gap in scholarship, and I really wanted to fill that. And also, I, I really feel strongly about accurately telling the story of Can't See Jazz and Charlie Parker, because so much had been written had been myth, yeah. you know, misinformation. And so that's really how I, 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 I got started on my research. And since it's a story of one person, I had the luxury of telling the story in a more linear fashion. Yeah. And, you know, it's all a process, too. Find me, when I was doing the Kansas City book, is really where I found my voice as a writer. Yeah. I, um, let me see, I don't know, how do, we, how do we put this? I finished the second, I finished the first draft, and I showed it to Steve Paul, the Kansas City Star. And he said, you know, I don't really see it. I don't really smell it. I don't really hear it. Or, you know, I don't see it, vision it. And I was a little taken back because, you know, I'd written the book and I was really, you know, really hot shit and all that. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I realized he was right that maybe I should uh, do some, uh, uh, if you put in a few adjectives. And so I rewrote <laughs> it a second time. And by the time I finished the second draft, my voice was different from the, than, than from the earlier, from the, from the previous draft. And so I, re re I found my voice and so I rewrote it a third time. I was happy with it then. So the Parker book was really not me, was, it's, it's a lot different because I found my voice as a writer and I, you know, it, it, I was able to, uh, to accomplish it quicker, shall we say, write, sure. write it a lot quicker. Uh, but the thing about writing about Charlie Parker is that it's a very intimidating proposition because he's a transitional figure. He's such a major figure, not only in, in jazz, but into world culture. Absolutely. And, and a lot of questions were answered in that. That's So I'm going to kind of bounce around here. I'm going to go back to the early earlier part of our trajectory here where you met a lot of the a lot of people at the Mutual Musicians Foundation or really knew a lot of people in town. What was the most interesting thing to you about what was going on at 18 and Vine during the heyday? Why is it so alluring for people around the world to look at Kansas City and say, man, that right there is something I want to know more about? Well, because, you know, Kansas City is one of the four cradles of jazz, and really 18th and Vine is where it happened. I mean, it, they, they played all over town. But this is where Mary Lou Williams and Charlie Parker and Count Basie and Lester Young, you know, veritable who's who of, of Kansas City, of jazz, not just Kansas City jazz, lived and worked. And I think there's a certain romanticism around that era. You know, Kansas City was a very exciting place. Uh, you know, you had the Pendergast machine lording over the city. The city was a 24-hour town with, you know, gamblers shooting dice on pool tables in the front window of the Lone Star as people walked by and just gawked at it, you know. Uh, it's a very romantic place. And there were still vestiges of that in, in 18th and Vine. And, and all these people had lived that life. Yeah. And they lived it. Yeah. You know, Buddy Anderson and, and, and you know, Piggy and Rudy Williams, man, they would tell me stories about Bird you could not believe. Yeah. And, and you know, they, they took me, they befriended me. And George Salisbury's the same way. Uh, they befriended me. And, you know, that really sparked my interest in finding out more. And one of, one of my great regrets is I did not use, I did not record them when, yeah. I, when, when I could have when I was younger. I was too busy, you know, partying with them. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, we were just hanging out. We were partying, yeah. man. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, they're all pretty much gone now. You know, Rusty Tucker and Lucky Wesley. And when I was doing the Kansas City book, I, I was able to contact them, and, and they were able to straighten me out on a lot of things, too. But to get to know Jamie Shan, go over and hang over his, hang out, hang out over his house. And he, and because we were friends, these guys would tell me things. Yeah. They wouldn't necessarily tell other people. And I wasn't, you know, a lot of times when researchers would come to town, they would be outsiders, you know, but for me, I was I was on the inside. Yeah. 
And all these guys knew my phone number, you know. They would come in Penny Lane when I worked in the record business, is really where I met them too. And they'd come and shop for jazz records, you know. So uh, I was very fortunate to get to meet them. Well, it would have been a hell of a lot easier these days with the ease of digital technology to record something, though, you know. Um, oh, yeah. You know, 10, 15 years ago, you'd have to get the old tape out, and it would be a big production, and it's a little easier these days. But uh, I, I want to get a sense of who your jazz heroes are, who you look up to the most in jazz. Well, you know, one, one of my heroes, because I have a lot of jazz heroes, and, and I like a lot of different styles of jazz. You know, I don't just listen to Kansas City style. I like, uh, you know, the outside stuff. I like old, the old Ricky Ticky kind of old, old fashion. I think one of my heroes, my hero really is, of course, Charlie Parker because of the, the research I've done into him and I have, I have a great understanding of his life. Mary Lou Williams and Lester Young. Uh, I found Count Basie to be kind of, kind of a, Funny cat man, you know, basically in his his biography, he, anytime something unpleasant comes up, he goes, I don't want to go, well, we won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about his first wife, Vivian Wynn, who, who divorced him on the front page of the Kansas City Star. And I actually knew Basie, I met Basie, and he was a sweetheart of a guy. I like the Lester Young, I'm very interested in him, Mary Lou Williams, Buster Smith, and a lot of the kind of unsung heroes of, of the, the territorial band tradition of Kansas City as man tradition. Harry Smith, who uh, brought Count Basie into the Gonzell White Show. Uh, he was a, the world's champion buck and wing dancer. He came here in the 20s. He's quite a character. And he used to say to Basie every tub, every tub. And he died of acute alcoholism in the Booker T Hotel in 1933, mm -hmm. December. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate. Uh, you know, and, and just, there's it's just a, George Salisbury was a hero of mine too because he he kind of transcended everything. A lot of those guys never they got stuck kind of in in, in jobs working for the post office later in life. But George, he was a true virtuoso and he worked for the conservatory. He taught a lot of the students uh, that are today. Tim Whitmer and Joe Cartwright were his students, as were many other the jazz musicians. And he was a very respected individual. He had a great deal of dignity. Yeah. Yeah. And looking, looking at taking a little different take on Bird. Absolutely, which was a fascinating look into him. Um, and that's the, that's kind of what I'm moving into next. There was one, before I get into the book, I wanted to ask you, and, and you may have already answered this, somebody that's really sat down with a lot of jazz musicians, you've had the fortunate opportunity to do that. Is there one musician that you haven't met that you would love to meet, and why would that be? Hmm, I have to think about that for a minute. You know, um, somebody that I, I've never... 
never met a chemistry musician. I've never, I've never, I can't recall if we've ever really met or not. Is Pat Metheny. I think Pat Metheny is a very interesting individual. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, uh, you know uh, and I mean, he's, he's fascinating with what he's done. By the way, he's, he's an extension of that of the Kansas City tradition. Charlie Parker is a culmination of the Kansas City jazz tradition of the, of the 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, you know, he, he, all the elements that, that, that distinguish Kansas City jazz come together in his music. A uh, strong sense of swing, uh, feeling for the blues, the great improvisation that, that came out of the jam sessions, uh, in, in the late night jam sessions in Kansas City, uh, the, the making it up, the living in the now, making art in the now. And the, the, that adage that Gene Ramey about, uh, you know, uh, you know, he talks about it, you know, only when you solo, let it mean something if it's only one note. And, and, you know, that's, that that's the culmination. That's what Bird's all about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the one thing, uh, and, and I really want to kind of segue into the book here, the thing before I get into the book, the cover, it's interesting. I had it laying around throughout the week reading it, and I didn't want to read it too quick. I really wanted to kind of do it over the days and kind of let it absorb in. I would catch that book in different shadows, the way the cover is, and I would get different expressions on his face. Was that intentional? No, well, you know, I had nothing to do with that. That was done by the University of Illinois Press, which I might add is really an outstanding press to work with. Yeah. The photo itself was taken at Billy Berg's when he went there in 1946. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ross Russell writes about the suede jacket he had on and the, and the shirt and the, and the, the tie with, with this knotted, the square knot. That came from Dave Dexter Jr.'s collection. And one of the things that makes it compelling is Dave, when he used it in one of his previous books, he had airbrushed out the, the background. Yeah. And it, th there's other pictures, other versions of that picture. It was distributed to a downbeat and a lot of other uh, places. Uh, is that it, it originally it had the, the upholstered band shell from, from uh, Billy Bird's in the back. But, but all you see there is the bird. And I know the, 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 the packaging is really quite stunning. They did a wonderful job. Yeah, they sure did. Um, what would you ask Bird if you could sit down and talk to him? Oh, I don't know. I'd kind of sit down and say, well, Bird, how you been? <laughs> you know, I don't want to hear how he's been. Yeah. Bird had a way of empathizing with the people that he met. And he, he created, and it created vastly different impressions of what he was like. Yeah. You know, he was almost like a chameleon. Yeah. Uh, if you read Robert Reisner's book, you'll, it's like the, there's 82 different birds there. Yeah. I, I'd ask him about Buster Smith and about, you know, uh, Stravinsky. Uh, you know, he really lived in the moment when he would talk, when his interviews he talks about where he found inspiration. He found inspiration in everyday things. Yeah. And, you know, he, he you know, could, how shall I put this? Um, you know, when, when, if a pretty girl would walk in the room when he was playing, he'd play, a pretty girl is like a melody or... You know, you can look it up on the internet and find all the pop references in his songs, in yeah. his compositions, you know, where he would quote it. Uh, I'd have to ask him, just, uh, I don't know, I would just want to sit down and just kind of hang with him like I would the rest of the Kansas City cats and joke around. Yeah. You know, he liked to joke around, liked to kid around. Um, he was a man of few words uh, at, at times. Other times he'd be talkative, you know. Sure. It's very hard to pin down what he's like. That was one of the great challenges of the book. So how big do you think that symbol toss by Philly Joe to Silence Bird? Do you think that really resonated deeply with him throughout his life? Yes, it did. You mean the Joe Jones incident where he threw the symbol at his feet? Yeah. Yeah, that, that resonated with Bird. Um, you know, the, as I mentioned in the book, the um, cutting contest for rites of passage for young musicians. And... Um, you know, when Joe Jones, and it happened in, in spring of 1936, uh, that's when Joe Jones came into the Reno Club. Uh, and, you know, that really humiliated him publicly, and he said, I'm going to show you cats. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, 
I'm going to show you guys. And so he he went to his mother's house, that retreated his mother's house, and practiced his saxophone with uh, Rebecca Ruffin. Uh, what it did is it caused him to get married to Rebecca Ruffin, you know, uh, to prove his manhood. Yeah. And then once that happened, then he had to make a living, you know. And the only way he could make a living was was being a musician. Um, I mean, that's was his destiny. Yeah. That's what he did. Um, you know, African Americans <laughs> at that time didn't have many opportunities for advancement. You know, you could be a porter or you know, work in a garage or something like that. But he was a musician. He was a creative individual. So that was his path, and that kind of forced him to be a man, to man up, and, you know, so uh, it did have a profound effect on him. There's a number of watershed incidents in his life. That's one of them. The other one, of course, is the wreck Thanksgiving Day in 1936 when he was on his way to Musser's Ozark Tavern, and the uh, car hit a slick spot and flipped, and flipped over about five or six times and broke his back and his ribs, and he got a new horn out of it. And he also became addicted to heroin that was prescribed for his pain uh, when he was recuperating. And so he was 16 years old and he had a heroin habit. You know, uh, that's a heavy thing for a kid. Uh, and, you know, and he struggled with it the rest of his life. And, you know, they talk a lot about how you know, ragged his horn was. You, know, you hear a lot about that. But what I've discovered recently, and it's always a process of discovery, is that, you know, he would do things like cover his pad with cellophane so they'd seal better. Yeah. And he purposely used rubber bands because the action was faster than the springs. Hmm. So he was always messing with his horn. And it looked, the horn may have looked like it was ragged, right. but it really wasn't. He was, he was experimenting with his horn uh, to uh, make it faster and to keep up with his ideas. Uh, it was a fascinating story, man. Well, it sounds like he was an engineer by trade, you know. If that's what he's oh, yeah. doing. Well, he could fix cars. Yeah. You know, there, there's, there's accounts of him, you know, somebody's car breaking down, and he would just get up and mess with the carburetor and start. Wow. So it, it seems like that Ozark's period of his life was kind of a bitch goddess. He almost, he broke his back, got weaned on heroin, but at the same time, he honed his skills, and when he came back here, people were like, wow, that guy's different. Yeah, he, you know, in, in my Kansas City book, I got it wrong. Uh, I, I had placed him down in the Ozarks in 36, but the next summer after his accident, when he recuperated, he went down to Monsters Ozark Tavern with the George e. Lee Band. And, and Monsters, of course, you know, a lot of people said it was a roadhouse and all this stuff. It was actually a nice resort. It had these 14 cottages, English-style cottages. It had, it had a hotel and had a, a ballroom where everybody they played nightly. But the thing of it is, is it's in Little Dixie. So, uh, you know, an area where these small towns, an African-American doesn't want to get caught after the sun goes down. Yeah. Uh, you know, sundown community. So he had to stay on site, and there was nothing really for him to do but practice, and that's what he did. And when he returned to Kansas City, he was a musically changed man. Yeah. You, you know, probably one of the most true narrators of the Kansas City tradition was Gene Ramey, and Gene Ramey talks about that. Mm-hmm. And he was with him when he was at, a lot of people doubted this, this Reno Club incident, but Ramey was with him when it happened, he, and he t- talks about these oral histories that I was fortunate to get my hands on. And he also talks about how when he returned, uh, you know, he could, he was just, people were astounded at how talented he was. By the time he, by, by what, what a virtu- virtuoso he was, by the time he left Kansas City, he was uh, truly a fully formed musician who was already playing bebop. Yeah. Uh, you know, when he met Gillespie in the summer of July 1941, Gillespie was just blown away by how advanced he was because Gillespie was still in his Roy Eldridge phase. Sure. And nobody was playing the music that he was playing. And, uh, you know, Mittens had been kicking, was kicking up at that time. And the, the people, these young musicians who were sick of playing in big bands, Want to get together after hours and jam, that's where the bebop comes in. And, you know, Monk and Kenny Clark were, were playing in mittens and playing, playing the same, moving in the same direction. But Bird, you know, he, by the time he left Kansas City, 
do is he was the fully formed musician playing bebop. You know, the interesting thing about Parker and bebop that you pointed out in your book was that he loves Stravinsky. And when you think about that classic background that he had, it's no surprise that that's kind of where he was going with the way bebop is structured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny how how, how the influence, uh, the influence is, is, is you know, it, they were going through the process of developing bebop, Gillespie and 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 Bird. And yeah, it's, I'm not I'm not surprised at all because I mean he was known to pour over Stravinsky uh, scores when they were out with Earl Father Hines on the road. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he quoted Stravinsky, and he's a lot like Ellington in that Ellington wanted to elevate music of his people by incorporating classical music into the language of his music. And Bird was, was, was very similar. I mean, he, he knew what he was doing. Yeah. And he, this, and he loved classical music. Absolutely. So you were talking about watershed moments in his life. One thing I think is big, and I want you to kind of elaborate on it, what kind of influence do you think it had on Charlie to have his uh, dad getting murdered by his girlfriend? Well, you know, his father... You know, previous accounts had talked about how his father abandoned the, the family when he was a child. But actually, uh, Charlie's father was um, uh, with the family until Charlie was like uh, 12 years old. And the family remained intact except for a brief separation. I don't think it had as much effect on Bird because I don't get the, I, I, from what I can tell, uh, he wasn't that close to his dad. His dad wasn't much of a father. Right. To either... Uh, Bird or Ike, his half brother. It was Addy all the way, and his father worked as a porter on the uh, railroad huh. uh, for for you know during when, when Charlie was really young. Yeah. And as part of that uh, job, he had to be on the road all the time. Yeah. So he he was really an absent absent chief father. Yeah. So one thing that I was thinking, why couldn't we have gotten a picture of Parker and Einstein together having a beer? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, well, that would be beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah. and Junior, that was with Junior Williams with, with him when, when that happened. Junior Williams remembers it. And Amin al also refers to it in his book. Wouldn't that be something else? Oh, that'd be cool. That's just a great visual, you know. Yeah. Um, so do you think the moldy figs really dislike the hipsters out of kind of a reverent jealousy, ultimately? Mm-hmm. Well, I think I think they didn't understand the new movement. I mean, we all have a tendency to hold on to hold up our own experiences, being superior, you know, to all those kids, you know, this that generation. There, there was a serious split in the jazz community at that time, and like for example, uh, Louis Armstrong didn't get it. Right. He talked. He bad mouth got bebop. Uh, so did you know? They really did not get it, but. Eventually, I think they found some common ground uh, with those broadcasts that were brought together, that were engineered by uh, Barry Ulanoff and uh, in New York later on when the Moldy Pigs and the, uh, uh, the, the Beboppers get together, uh, you know, and, and, and did the radio programs. I think that, that served a lot to bring, bring them together. Mostly, though, you know, it's mostly the, the jazz collectors that, that have this kind of conception about what jazz is like find jazz and put it in categories uh, more so than the older musicians but you know like I said you, that, McGee, that interview with Howard McGee it's quite telling that he was he's playing the modern music on the west coast and Kid Ory didn't want to hear it yeah absolutely so yeah. do you think the mental institutions that Charlie went to ultimately saved him in the end or contributed to his downfall I think going to Camarillo uh, going to Camarillo uh, really saved him uh, because he'd been on the street and, uh, you know, Moose and Moose had gotten busted and he, there was a crackdown on the heroin and he he did okay when he could, when he could get heroin. It's when he couldn't get heroin he started drinking, that's when he'd have the problems. Yeah. And that, that was the case during that time of his life, too. And so he... Um, you know, started drinking really heavily, and, and they talked about the, uh, the jerky movements. Uh, Howard Mickey talked about the jerky, jerky movements when he was trying to play, and the horn would pop up and all that. That's a sign of pretty acute alcoholism. Yeah. Uh, he very well may not have lived much past 1946 if he hadn't had the breakdown and uh, at the Civic Hotel and landed in Camarillo. We gave him six months to, uh, he hadn't been straight six months since he was 16 years old. 
Yeah. And, you know, I mean, his consumption of alcohol was just incredible. Yeah. Uh, during that period of his life. So he could have very well have, have you know, not made it <laughs> to 1947. Right. And gone there. And That's then later on, of course, I think that, uh, I don't know whether, you know, the, 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 his, his struggles with mental illness were inherent or if they were caused by the alcohol right. uh, and heroin. But later on, you know, the pictures you see of him in 1955 in like the Beehive in Chicago, you can tell something's not right there. Yeah, without a doubt. He's, he's struggling. Uh, in the stories about him, him in, at Birdland, uh, you know, he's struggling there too when he has, he has his breakdown there and, you know, commits himself to Bellevue and they try to commit suicide. And a lot of people had speculated that that was just a, a gesture. But, you know, Chan, you know, tells a different story. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he, uh, you know, he, he struggled with that. I think he had issues uh, that he, he self medicated, like a lot of people do that have issues. Yeah. Without a doubt. Who, who do you think was better, Bird or Dizzy? I think Bird was a, a better musician and a better composer. Uh, they're very different cats. Uh, Bird was very uh, in control on stage, uh, very composed. Off stage, he was a wild man, you know, and his life was just crazy. And Bird and Gillespie, you know, um, how shall I put it? They were just different. I wouldn't say one's better than the other. And Gillespie would clown on stage, and he was criticized that for, for that. Yeah, and you know he he mess around with people up on stage. And he liked the spotlight a lot, and then off stage, had a very conservative lifestyle. And he was married to Lorraine for many years, and would go home and always had a stable uh, home life, which which Bird didn't have. Right. Yeah. Very true. Um, I was surprised at how many times in your book it was referenced that someone wanted to kill Charlie, and. One of the biggest ones was Miles Davis, and when he finally made the split, can we thank Charlie Parker for Miles' album, Birth of Cool? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, Miles apprenticed with Bird. Um, you know, he when he was coming up, he was not on the level of the Gillespie or Bird. He was not as fully formed musician. And I think that that in a lot of ways the whole birth of the, what became known as the birth of the cool was a reaction to Bebop and Charlie Parker where Charlie Parker filled the space with notes uh, you know Miles played around space yeah built his compositions around space it's like the you know, like the antithesis of Bebop is, is, I, is what I think uh, uh, what, what Miles is creation of the cool school and Miles you know he's a very fiery individual I mean, he'd be yeah. And, and he was, and Bird, in their relationship, Bird was a big dog, and that just set well with Miles, I think, in a lot of ways. I think there was a lot of resentment towards Bird. Yeah. You know, Miles just speaks horribly about Bird in his biography. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so speaking of Bebop, do you think Bebop was the answer to racism in America and maybe Europe fully got it because they embraced it so much differently than we did? Well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think Bebop, uh, I don't think it's reaction to racism as, as much as reactive reaction to the kind of uh, creative uh, stagnation of the swing era mm. and the urge for these musicians to be heard and to, to say something on their own. Uh, you know, it's all small group. At that time, they, all those beboppers came out of big bands. And Bird didn't like to play in a big band because he couldn't get enough solos in. Yeah, yeah. And they, they want their young lions. Uh, they're all young people. They're in their 20s. They're ready to assert themselves, you know, and that's how they did it, the music. Uh, Bird himself, you know, what I find interesting is, uh, you know, uh, Bird, of course, grew up, lived in a white neighborhood from 1927 to 1932. Uh, attend the school in Westport, which is a mixed race community. Mm -hmm. And he was not hung up on race like, say, Mingus was or some of the other, uh, his contemporaries. Uh, you know, if you look at his bands, he, he always led integrated bands. You know, I mean, Chet Baker was one of his favorite trumpet players. Mm -hmm. uh, much to the chagrin of Art Farmer and the other trumpet players on Central 
Avenue, Red Rodney, you know, and he would bring them along, uh, Lou Levy, uh, you know, uh, he always had white, he always, you know, he, he didn't see it in race, but it, the, his existence in race, he wasn't defined by race. Right. He was beyond category on that. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because if you see pictures that are taken of him with his fans, often they're white fans. Right. Uh, uh, William Claxton took this wonderful picture of him in Pasadena, I think, with this couple and this young band. And it's like a family picture portrait, only it's Bird's other family. It's all white people. And uh, there's accounts that I didn't occur, uh, didn't include in the book because I, I couldn't get fully clearance from the individual uh, interviewed. Uh, whenever he would come to town, he would hang out at this, uh, this guy's house who was uh, a white was the biggest pot distributor in, in the area. Yeah. And, you know, they were, they were a, lot of, like, a lot of criminals. They were all the second story men and all that stuff. But Bird used to go over there and hang out all the time. He'd go over there and hang out. And they were all, they were all white guys and criminals, huh. you know. Uh, Buster Smith talks about how Bird uh, would jam with the white guys, like uh, Charlie White, Bud Calvert was a good friend of his. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of beyond category on race. Well, and it's interesting because in your book and everything that I've ever read about Charlie, he's always transcended that. I've never gotten a feeling that he was strongly, uh, felt strongly cited. A lot of musicians at that time did feel that way, you know. They'd play on stage, they had to stay in the back because they couldn't be up front with the white folks. So, you know, that's one thing I've always known about Bird, especially in your book, that it's just not something that's mentioned because it wasn't a part of the fabric of who he was. No, it's really not. Um, it's kind of kind of funny because uh, you know how how that how that that has been. A lot of a lot of people cast him as that way. Yeah. Uh, you know he's a, he's he's very interesting. And in, in, if you look at him, you strip away the musician and you look at him just as a person. He's a very interesting person. Well, speaking of him being interesting, this is going to segue into my next segment here. You know, he was a busy guy. He was married to Rebecca, Jerry, and Doris living with Chan, and, you know, his heart was obviously heavy. I, I, now, I want to ask you, do you think he was starting to go into his dark period when Chan had an abortion and he killed that cat? Do you think that was the beginning of a very dark path he was going down? Yeah, I think, well, I, th I think if he had stuck with, I know Chan was not good for Bird. Right. Um, you know, he loved her, and, and she loved him. She wasn't mature at that time. She was. If, if, when you read her biography, it's like the biography of a young of a young woman or a little girl. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if he'd stayed with Doris, I think he'd been better off because Doris would always take care of business, and Doris would buy him clothes, and he could concentrate on his career. But with Chan, it was a whole different thing, um, and I think he did enter a real dark period as a result. So, do you think at the end of his life he went to stay with Nika, the patron saint of jazz, because he knew he was going to die, or do you think it was just another stop on the bus route? I think he knew something wasn't right. We, we do when it comes to our health, but I think he needed a place, a refuge. Uh, he would go to Sheila Jordan's house and stay there, too. Uh, you know, uh, it wasn't uncommon for him to do that. Uh, he, you know, he had no place to go because he was cut loose by Chan, and you know, this whole image of him riding this subway all night long, and you know, he, you know, he just didn't have any place else to go. And he, if, you, if you've ever seen the Stanhope, the Stanhope's right across from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Yeah. I mean, it is, uh, uh, you know, a very nice place. And if you're, if you're not feeling good and you need some refuge, that's where you go. Yeah, sure. And you know, she, she was a friend of his. I mean, she wasn't as close to him as she was Monk. Uh, but uh, she really liked Monk, and um, but that was the place he, he wanted to go, and that's so when he needed refuge. That's where she gave that to him. Yeah. And you know, there's all this these Ross Russell. And, uh, one of one of the really rich resources that I came across. 
Ross that I, that I was able to utilize was at the Ross Russell Collection, University of Texas in Austin. And in it, um, it's quite telling, not so much for what, you know, Ross wrote about the bird, but for the papers and the correspondence and all that. It really tells a story. He was, you know, Ross Russell sensationalized birds alive. He, he incorporated fictive elements at the urging of Albert Goldman. And he was obsessed with whether, um, you know, Bird was intimate with Nika. And, and from everything I read, he, he was actually obsessed with that. And from what I read, he wasn't. He was just friends. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and she loved musicians, and she, you know, was a patron saint of bebop musicians. And that's why he went there. Absolutely. So the thunderclap she described there at the end, um, do you think that was proof that he left too soon or just another metaphor for the influence he had on this world? I think it's a wonderful metaphor. That's why I started the, the, um, the, the forward off on with his death. It's a wonderful metaphor. And that whole Reisner talking about how one musician speculate, speculated that he disintegrated the pure sound. I mean, that is magic right there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's, that's very interesting stuff. Absolutely. But, but, you know, when I wrote the book, I wrote the book, and, and, and it's a real clean read. Yeah. Uh, you know, my editor said that she never had such a clean manuscript, never worked with such a clean manuscript. And it's because I... Um, I worked on it for so long, you know, went over it and combed it. How, 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 long did it, how long did it take you? Uh, from 2005 until it was published, uh, until last year. Okay. Um, uh, you, you know, originally I, I, was, I was offered it to Oxford, but they had declined, they declined on it because they already had uh, the, the reprint of uh, my Priestley's biography in their catalog. They'd reprinted that, so they weren't interested in having another Charlie Parker biography. And I wasn't really sure if I could get a publisher, because getting publishers are really, it's a really difficult proposition. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Bill Tuttle, Dr. Uh, Professor Bill Tuttle at uh, KU, um, knew a retired an, an emeritus editor from University of Illinois Press. I've been interested in them for some time, and he put me in touch with him. Uh, Dick Wentworth was his name, is his name, and Dick Wentworth, uh, you know, I sent him a proposal, he said, why don't you send a manuscript, and I sent him the manuscript, and from there it went very quickly. Wonderful. And I was, I was, I was, I was, able, I was able to, hold on a second. Sure. Uh, I was able to, um, you know, uh, I was fortunate in that I was able to, uh, to find a publisher for it. Yeah. And, you know, these days that's not easy. Right. Uh, it's easy to self-publish, but trying to find a publisher is a difficult thing. And I was very grateful to work with them. Yeah. They've done a wonderful job with it, I mean, as you can tell. Absolutely. It's, it's a beautifully assembled book. Oh, I agree, it is. It's very beautiful. Um, you know, the one thing I kept thinking about now that we're kind of in the modern era, and I think I'm old enough to understand the cusps of how information um how we got it previously versus now. I think it's lucky that Charlie didn't leave and didn't live in a social media world because there was a lot of things in this book that if passerbys in New York would have had a camera on, it would have been pretty unflattering and it would have just added more lore to what he was doing. Yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with you. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that I try and do when, when I'm writing and uh, writing the book. And what's important is that I'm preserving the history of an individual or a city, and I'm telling the story. That's what's really important. It's like the, like the musicians that came up out of the Kansas City tradition. They tell the story. Absolutely. That was the thing that they would do. And that's what uh, that's what I I try, I try to do with my my book on uh, Can't Say Jazz and Charlie Parker. Absolutely. It, you know you you're making sense of all this stuff to get to the truth of the story, and then and then it becomes for generations after that. Yeah. Uh, you know, my next project I'm really thinking about doing the Coon Sanders Original Night Hawk Orchestra. Uh, there's a white dance band that came out of Kansas City, they play jazz too. They become a metaphor. For America in the 1920s 
in the 1930s. Um, whereas, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the boom and then the bust. Right. And, and it's also a story populated by interesting characters. You know, as a society, it's not just us, but we're, we're, we, we are interested in men that act badly. Right. <laughs> we like Tony Soprano. Yeah. <laughs> we like Walter White. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we do. We're addicted. And, and, uh, Charlie falls under that category. He's a very interesting guy that, that is a result. Yeah, for sure. Um, I got a couple more questions for you here. Uh, first of all, why did he not want to come back to Kansas City? And especially in Clint Eastwood's film, they made a very, very poignant point that he did not want his body brought back to Kansas City. Is that true? And if it is, why? You know, I'm not sure that's true. That, that's the, the thing about about Bird, Eastwood's Bird, is that's really Chan's story. Right. Uh, it's told from her perspective. And, and Chan is not always what you would call a reliable narrator. Yeah. Uh, you know, Charlie often returned, Bird often returned to Kansas City. Uh, there's instances where, and when he did, he was a big star here. Everybody knew Charlie Parker. I mean, on the streets, all the little kids knew who Charlie Parker was. Yeah. And he would return often to Kansas City um, because usually after tours, he'd need to drum up some money so he could play Chinese Maker and make enough money to get back home. Yeah. A little change in his pocket. And he came here and he's part of the fabric. Amin al talks about, uh, you know, walking up the street and seeing Bird standing in front of the boulevard room where he's playing and talking to Bird. And, and a certain musician is very nervous because Bird had given some money and he didn't have what Bird needed. And then along comes Bird's uh, aunt. And she says, you're going to play for me, Charlie? And he goes, come on in. She says, you know, I can't go in. I'm a church lady. So he played My Mother's Eyes out on the street. Wow. I mean, he was he was, he was he was part of Kansas City. Kansas City was part of him. Yeah. And I think that the thing of it is, is, of course, when you hear a song like, uh, you know, Parker's Mood with lyrics that were written by uh, King Pleasure, you know, maybe you, you don't want to. But ultimately, that was Addie's decision because in the chat never married. Yeah. Bird. And she brought him back here so she could be buried with him. Right. Right next to him. And she was ultimately the one that called it. And, but he, he didn't have the disdain or the dislike for his hometown that's portrayed there. He he, lo- he loved Kansas City. He'd come back here and hang out and play two days, two weeks. He'd play for a month in Kansas City. He was a mama's boy. He'd come back and often to visit Annie. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's a there's a there's different tales that are spun out there, and I knew that you would diffuse that. Um, my final question to you, Chuck, is this: Are we ever going to get tired of Charlie Parker and the story and anything new that is going to come out about him? Well, you know, I've discovered a couple of new things actually since the book was published, and I don't think we'll ever get tired of Bird. Uh, I think Bird is part of our myth. Hmm. Uh, He's a, 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 an American tragedy, you know, Theodore Dreiser, you know, American tragedy. Sure, His sure. story is, is a particularly American story of, of triumph and tragedy, and, and that attracts us. Yeah. As, as it's in the national interest. And also, new generations get introduced to birth. You know, he was a transitional figure, not only in music, but in art. Yeah. And, you know, writers, Jack Kerouac wrote about him. Uh, you know, poets have written about him. Uh, you know, there's, there's dances, Alvin Ailey. You know, he, he's such a such a an influential individual in our culture. He, he, he will, he will, there's a, there will be continual interest in him. Bird lives. He does. He does. <laughs> For that's, sure. That's, that's why I ended it on. You yeah. know, and I really, I'm really glad you enjoyed the book. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Chuck, I appreciate you taking your time to talk with me. This has been. Uh, this has been a thrill, and, and thank you for everything that you do for this town. I love your show. I've been a listener for uh, a couple decades now, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great evening. Thanks for listening to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players, authors, and orchestrators in jazz. And thanks to Mr. Chuck Haddock for his time and insight into jazz, bird, and the litany of his skills. If you want to hear more interviews, you can go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, or you can get 
all things Neon Jazz at theneonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.